Now you may not know this, but uh, last night Billy Graham died. Now you may not even know who Billy Graham is. It's uh, not uncommon in this age of instant celebrities and then just as instant forgottens that uh, great people uh, can be ignored or just overlooked. Uh, Graham, in his lifetime, preached to uh, about 210 million people in over 180 countries. Uh, that's just never happened before. It may never happen again, and God has a, a many ways to do his work, but Graham was extraordinary, uh, just a country boy from uh, South Carolina. Uh, who was greatly anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, Graham, um, when he was a college student, uh, there's a place some of you know called Forest Home Christian Conference Center. It's east of Los Angeles. I worked there seven summers uh, in my college and seminary days. Met my wife there last summer. And, uh, but there was a college conference at Forest Home that started back in the late 40s. And Graham... Uh, was just out of college. Uh, he was starting to be an evangelist, but he had real doubts about the Bible. And he really wondered, could he trust it as, uh, as the Word of God? And uh, he was really on, on the cusp of really making a decision uh, to do something else. But it was at a college conference at Forest Home in around 1949-1950, and I, I, I can show you the spot. In fact, he asked that there be a kind of a memorial spot put there where he, uh, in prayer, just said to the Lord, said, Lord, I'm going to preach uh, the Bible as your word for the rest of my life. And if you uh, know Graham uh, and heard many of his sermons, he, he would repeatedly say, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Uh, he stood on the authority of Scripture. Well, uh, going to miss you, Billy. Uh, we'll see you again. But a great, great man at age 94 or 95, I'm not sure exactly what, has, uh, has gone to be with Christ. Well, I want to start with the Bible. And uh, what we're going to do, i got seven more times to talk to you guys before uh, I retire from East Westmont. And uh, I've been in thinking, well, what do I want to say? Uh, what's really important to me? Well, uh, hopefully what I say is important, whether it's important to me or not, but this uh, series of messages I'll give are very important to Ben Patterson. And you're going to recognize stuff that I've just kind of been saying one way or another uh, ever since you've been here and before you got here. But there's a psalm I want to start with. It's, uh, it's a prayer of David's. And as we've been doing, I'm going to read the psalm slowly to you, ask you to ask the Holy Spirit to get your mind off of whatever you're doing, any schoolwork, any other things with your devices, just put it away and listen to the Word of God and ask the Spirit to alert you to what you need to pay attention to. Now, I'm going to say things that I think you need to pay attention to, but I'm going to ask that you ask the Lord to speak to you personally about this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour my flesh, which, by the way, is a, a sort of a poetic way of saying to slander me, to speak evil of me. When my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. 
Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me, and do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. And if there's a word or phrase that got your attention, just silently repeat it to yourself and ask God why. What you might need to do about that. The psalm about praying your anxiety. And everybody has it. Uh, Shel Silverstein uh, wrote a poem about the what ifs. You see, our anxieties become some form of what if. And it's a child whose voice is used in the poem. It goes like this Last night, as I lay thinking here, some what ifs crawled inside my ear. And pranced and partied all night long and sang their same old what if song. What if I'm dumb in school? What if they've closed the swimming pool? What if I get beat up? Must be a junior higher. What if there's poison in my cup? What if I start to cry? What if I get sick and die? What if I flunk that test? Maybe a college student. What if green hair grows on my chest? What if nobody likes me? What if a bolt of lightning strikes me? What if I don't grow tall? What if my head starts getting smaller? What if the fish don't bite? What if the wind tears up my kite? What if they start a war? What if my parents get divorced? What if the bus is late? What if my teeth don't grow in straight? What if I tear my pants? This is mine. What if I never learned to dance? Everything seems well, and then the nighttime what ifs strike again. Well, there are a lot of things to be afraid of when you're a little kid, especially when you're lying in bed at night thinking about, well, what could happen to me? What could happen to me? And you know, it doesn't get better when you're a college student, right? Uh, not long ago, the Orange County Register published a survey of the results of a survey of college students, and uh, this could have been any time in the last decade, uh, but it was in the Orange County Register, and uh, let me give you some numbers from this student health survey. 93.4% of the students surveyed reported feeling overwhelmed by all they had to do at least once during the year. 91.5% is the number of students who reported feeling exhausted at least once a year. 80.4% reported feeling very sad at least once during the year. 62.2% said they felt Things were hopeless. 43.8% said they felt so depressed it was difficult to function. And it impacted their schoolwork. Lower grades, dropped classes, stress, sleep difficulties, family members. And the recommendations were, well, we need to increase the number of psychoanalysts and psychiatrists and psychologists to decrease the waiting times. Uh, we need to form campus crisis response teams. We need to develop an intervention program that would help head people off before they just generally fall apart. And you know, we can do all of that. The picture in the uh, Orange County Register was a picture of a group of students sitting in the lotus position uh, with a professor and the word AUM, A-U-M, on the blackboard. 
And they were trying to chill out. They were meditating. They were breathing more deeply. They were trying to find things that they could think about that were positive. And that's all good. You can do that. But the psalm says you can learn to pray it. Uh, the way David prayed his anxieties and his fears. Now, I, I want to say this a few times in the time I have left here. You learn to pray. Now, anyone can say a prayer of some kind, and God is kind. He, he, he's tender. He listens. He cares about you. But you want to learn to pray. You learn to pray the way you learn a language. You listen. In this case, to the Word of God. You copy what you hear. You repeat what you hear. You make it your own. Now, I think this was Thomas Aquinas who said this. I'm not sure. But there are three things you need to know to live a good life. You need to know what to do, what to believe, and how to pray. I really believe that. So, what do you need to know that's true? Well, you can pick any number of things. You can pick, the, you know, the Apostles' Creed or the, uh, the Nicene Creed. You can pick Holy Scripture. You can say, that's what I believe. That's what's true. And then you need to know what to do about it. That's morality. But this third thing, prayer, why is it so important? Well, for the simple reason that what you believe can be an arid, detached, uh, cognitive conviction, and it, roughly on the same level of knowing there's a sun in the sky. It doesn't really affect what you do, but it's okay, it's true, it's true. And God's commandments, the, the morality here can be the same thing. It's just sort of, well, the rules... But, but I, you know, I'm not really, I don't belong to them, but, but prayer says this is all personal. This is something, you talk to the God who told you what to believe. You talk to the God who tells you how to live. It's not abstract, it's personal. Uh, Carlo Coretta, the Catholic spiritual writer, said he, he doesn't trust theologians who don't pray. Why? Because if they don't pray, they must be treating God as an object, as a thing, as a, a, a datum. But when you go to prayer, God becomes a thou, a person. So David, as he prays his anxiety, notice what he does. He revels in his anxiety, in the what-ifs. Uh, notice how he talks about them. Verses 1 to 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? <laughs> the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though we war, a war break out against me, even then will I be confident. I've been there. I've done that. I've seen it happen over and over again. God has always taken care of me. And come on, bring it on. He's older. He's been through a few things. And that's one of the values of getting older. You discover how faithful God is. So, one way to pray your anxiety. If you want to pray like David did, simply look back. I'm okay. I'm alive. God has done great things. And that leads him to say, there is really, you know, there is really only one thing that I need to do now. Now, I, I hope you had your skeptical side peaked here. Just one thing? I mean, there's all kinds of people saying, well, it's this, it's this, it's this. But right here, David and Jesus will support this. He says, and you know, looking back, I can look at, okay, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. It, it, didn't, it didn't kill me. I was taken care of. And that really, there was only one thing I need to do. There are a lot of things to be afraid of. But only one thing I seek, and here it is, the one thing. One thing I ask of the Lord, verse 4, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Now, if you have a calendar out, if you've been looking at your schedule, if you've been thinking about the things you've got to do this week, there's, there's a lot more than one thing going on. And, and, and many of these things are things you simply cannot ignore. So there's three, four, five, six. You might feel overwhelmed because there are so many things that are demanding your attention. And that David says, but there's just one thing I really need to do. One. Yeah, one is, uh, I get a little philosophical here about numbers. One is more than just one. Uh, one is unique in a way that two isn't. Because you don't get two unless you have one. You don't get three unless you have one. You count off into infinity. You don't get out there to a, a zillion unless you had the one. So one is more than a number. One is a reality. It's, it's simple, really. Yes, there are lots of things. Maybe like the, there's, there's a wheel. It's got a hub in it, but then there are spokes. There's a rim. You need that to have a wheel, but you, you, can, you can have some spokes missing. You can have a bad rim, but if you don't have a hub, you don't have anything. So, the book of Proverbs starts off with saying, the fear of God, reverence for God, is the beginning. It's not the end. There's more to be done, but you won't get to it unless you start with reverence. And in this verse with, well, dwelling in the house of the Lord. Now, you need to know something about the temple in Israel. Uh, nobody lived in it except the priests. David was not a hermit. He was not a priest. He was a king. He, he was a general. His life was filled with details, filled with practical matters. And yet, he said, but the thing, the thing I want, the thing I seek, and I'm asking God to give me, is that I could live in his house forever. And what he means by his house now, now he's not aspiring to be a priest. He's just saying, but the house is where God is. And the one thing I ask is that I be with God. And notice the way he describes it. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Some translations say to delight in God's perfections. And again, this is not the musings of a, of a, 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 a hermit uh, of a priest. This is a man who's got work to do. But he says, I, the one thing I need, I must have, is to be with God and to... What does it mean to gaze upon his beauty? Well, throughout Scripture, it means just one thing. His word. Yeah, his creation. Although it's compared to us, it's amazing how how little the Bible says to find God in creation. It's just not a lot of it there. It's there. You know, he made it. It's good. Rejoice. But oh, the God who made this planet and made this universe has opinions. No, that's too harsh. He has a will. He has desires. He knows what's beautiful. He knows what's true. And when you gaze upon the perfections of God, it means you're singing about, singing of, reading about, listening to his word. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes, they do. Goes on a couple of verses, talks about how God speaks in creation, and then the rest of it is about, well, it's the law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are perfect, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. It goes on and on and on. And the Lord, thank you that you have told us what you think. It's beautiful. What do you need? It's to be with God and to gaze at his perfections. 
at his beauty, to practice his presence. We're priests. So he says, for in the day of trouble, verses 5 to 6, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. So David is chill. Nothing can shake him. He just sits back, breathes deeply, and peacefully. That's his mood. Well, not quite. Because no matter how many times you say, I've been there, I've done that, God is good, God is faithful, he's beautiful, he's true, there's always, oh guys, listen to me. <laughs> trust me, okay? I'm older than you. That had no reason to trust me, but just trust this part. No matter how confident you are now, say, or this afternoon, Something will happen. Someone will happen. That throw it all up in the air again for you. There's always something else, something new, that makes you wonder if you can delight in the perfections of God. It's never over. In fact, it gets harder as you get older. You're thinking, what? No, I, I don't want to say this to you, especially this time of year, and if we approach finals and stuff like that. You guys, this, you look back on this, was, this was the easy part of your life. It gets harder. However, you can get stronger by being in God's presence by gazing at his perfections, delighting in them, rejoicing in them. So David's got something else. He doesn't say what it is, but in verses 7 and following, Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. And he goes right back to where he was. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. This is the guy who's just said, been there, done that. But there's something new. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Now teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. It gets harder. But you can get stronger. And the answer is always the same. Seek his face. Why does it say face? It's because when you look at someone in the face, uh, there's something about the eyes, the smile, the and especially God's face. It's, it, 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 yeah, he'll, he, he can say things to you, but it's just like, oh, yes. He's smiling. Now, I, I hesitated to put this in my message, but I'm going to do it. Um, because, well, it just, well, I'm, yeah, let me know how it goes. I'll just tell you this thing about myself. Uh, once in a while, not often, in my life, I've had dreams where the Lord comes to me and says some very specific things. I, I could probably count on less than the fingers of one hand, but I've had a few of those dreams. Let me tell you one. I think maybe the most recent. I won't tell you what the issue was. But uh, in my dream, I, this is the end of a long period of me wrestling with kind of two things, two alternatives to my life. And I, and I just was asking God to show me which, which this one or that one. What do I do here? And, and this went on for more than a year. And I, I would talk to my friends about it. I would talk to my wife about it. And, and it, you know, if I, would, if I told you what it was, you'd say, oh, that's nothing. No, it was a big thing to me. And it bothered me. So one night, I, I had this dream. It's, again, it's one of those four or five dreams I've had. Where I know the Lord was speaking to me. In the dream, 
Uh, it, I was between services in my church. And there was a time where people were having coffee and kind of milling around and talking. And, and, and the word was that at the second service, Jesus was going to come and preach. And you know how dreams are. It, oh, good. I'm glad he's coming. You know, but it wasn't like, oh, Jesus is coming to preach second service. Uh, it was just, okay, good. I, and I was thinking, I got to get him before the service starts. I have to ask him about these two things. So I was looking around for him, and, you know, people standing around by the coffee machine, you know, and, and make, drinking bad coffee, and, and there's Jesus. Uh, he's somewhere. I look, and I found him. Don't ask me what he looked like. I just knew it was Jesus. So I, I went over to him and said, now, Jesus, before the service starts, I, I've been wanting to ask you about this. Would you, would you please explain to me? And then I laid it out to him. And he smiled at me. And I woke up. But I knew why he smiled. That's the point of the dream. The smile said, I love you, Ben. I love you. And all of a sudden, what I wanted to get instruction on didn't matter. He smiled at me. There's always new things. Always harder things. More than you know. His smile is everything. You need that more than advice more than what we call wisdom sometimes. You just need to be with him in his house to gaze upon the beauty of his perfections, to see his face. You can do that. Well, I close with another story. Then I want to give you a chance to kind of meditate on this and think about it for yourself. Uh, I climbed Mount Lyell uh, a long time ago with uh, some friends. It's the highest peak in uh, the Yosemite Park. And uh, uh, two of us, there were five on the trip, the two of us were total amateurs. You know, we were in pretty good physical condition, but we didn't know a thing about mountain climbing. And the other three guys were experts. And we camped the night before just above the timber line, and the next day we we're going to go up this glacier. And uh, it was, you know, and you wanted to leave early because you didn't want the glacier to start melting and get, get slippery. So you get up really early so you can get up to the peak and we packed our lunches and we started up to the peak. Again, two of us, you know, we're total amateurs. Uh, three are total experts. So we started out. And we kind of got spread out on the uh, side of the mountain and negotiating our ways around the glacier and, and various crevices and some, stuff like that. And, and I got to a place where I'm thinking, you know, now <laughs> the experts are going over there. But obviously, they don't see what I see over here. And I, wouldn't it be cool to beat them to the top and be sitting up there eating my lunch and smiling as they finally come to the peak and say, so what took you so long? So I took my way. And there was a reason why they didn't go that way, because I got to a place where I was at the top of a crevasse uh, there was a wall of granite, and then there was about a mile of now slippery ice. And I had nowhere to go. And if I slipped on that ice, I would not stop until I got to Fresno. <laughs> and I was stuck. Didn't know what to do. Well, one of the guys who was the expert knows me pretty well. Uh, he's, he died a few years ago. I miss him so much. Big guy. Uh, and he has a real kind of snarky grin, you know. He's got a great sense of humor. And he found me where I was, and he had an ice axe with him. And he came around the edge of that crevasse and looked at me and smiled. That snarky smile of his. He said, it looks like you need some help, Ben. 
Yeah, I do, Jim. I'll tell you what you got to do. I'll reach out. He's a big guy and a great distance there. He had to, I'll reach out as far as I can and I'll hack out a little stepping stone, stepping place here on the ice. And you'll be able to step out onto it. Now, he's over here, down here, on your, with your right foot, not your left. You want it to be your right foot. And put your foot in the place I've hacked out with the ice axe. And step out. And whatever you do, don't lean out. Excuse me. Don't lean in. Now, of course, my instinct is, I want to hug, I want to become one with that mountain. I want to, I want to just be in it, you know. So, no, no, you got to lean out from the mountain with your foot, and then you got to make this big step and come across standing erect and grab hold of my hand, and I'll pull you into safety. Now, this really happened. I, I remember looking at his face. I said, well, have we argued lately? <laughs> have we had any deep disagreements? Is there any reason... Oh, guys, don't miss this. Is there any reason I should stop trusting my friend? And I looked in his face. Yeah, he had that same snarky grin on his face. But that's my buddy there. And I was scared to death, still. But I stepped on the spot that he hacked out. I stepped across. He took me by the hand, pulled me across, hugged me, then teased me the rest of the trip. <laughs> well, the answer is always, you guys, always, no matter what it is, seek his face. Gaze on his beauty. Delight in his perfections. Look at him. You can trust him with whatever scares you. <laughs> I know of a teenage girl, the niece of a pastor friend of mine, Swedish. And she had a great faith. And at age 17, cancer took her. But she knew his face. And he tells me in the hospital room as she was near the end, thinking about dying, <laughs> she said this. Well, this should be interesting. Yeah, you bet. She's going to see his face. It's all you need. All you need. One thing only. His face. His smile. Let's take two minutes and reflect on what you may need to do with what's in this psalm or what I've said. And I'll close. And may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead the Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good to do his will. And may he work in you what pleases him through Jesus Christ. Amen.